Kicking off at number five, The Labyrinth. Because when we're talking about hell and the underworld, Clive Barker's interpretation of demons to some, angels to others, is a completely different kettle of fish, where all manners of body horrors and dimensional demonic entities find themselves in an equally terrifying house and home, which is aptly named Hell, or the more structurally appropriate, The Labyrinth. First penned in Barker's 1986 novella, The Hellbound Heart, and later expanded upon in the Scarlet Gospels, as well as the film and graphic novel series that followed, in Barker's world, his demonic Cenobites reside eternally in an unholy and evil realm of limitless pain or pleasure, if you're into that kind of thing. In its natural state, Hell takes on the form of the dark, winding labyrinth, most commonly visualised in the graphic series, but it also has the power to take on any shape or state, depending on the amassed pleasures or pains of the souls that are contained within it. Now, because of that, it has widely been speculated and somewhat confirmed by Barker that this is definitely not the Abrahamic version of Hell, but instead an extra dimension. In essence, the labyrinth is some form of permeable realm that can be perceived as heaven or hell by whoever is trapped inside. It's led some to believe that the labyrinth itself represents the true nature of the human mind and all of the infinite possibilities that reside within the cracks of reality. And you know, that's also not really accounting for the fact that it's ruled over by the eternal evil Leviathan, a creature of ancient chaos that perpetually levitates at the geographical centre of the labyrinth, watching over his hellish kingdom, raising towering sky blotting monoliths to glorify his dominion over the Cenobites and mankind. I mean, for the most part, despite being one of the most hellish depictions of hell itself, you can't deny that Barker created an incredibly interesting landscape for horror fiction. Coming in at number four, Dante's Inferno. Because if we're talking about hell, then finally we can mention the resounding work of classic literature, the 14th century epic poem that made up the first part of Dante's Divine Comedy, one of the most important works in the whole of canonical literature, and the allegorical progenitor of pretty much every hellish realm ever written after that. Also, this particular point goes out to the steadfast dedication of our top 5 scary viewer, Spencer Beard. Although we can't do an entire top 5 list of Dante's punishments, we can definitely condense them into one. So, yeah. There we have it, thanks. Now, as many of you will already know, Dante's depiction of hell is the archetype that laid the foundation for the vast majority of horror fiction, although it may not be as apparent as you may think. In the poem that begins on the evening of Maundy Thursday, the narrator, Dante himself, finds himself lost in a dark, dark wood, and after being nearly ravaged to death by three beasts, a leopard, a lion, and a wolf, he's rescued by the ghost of the Roman poet, Virgil, who leads him through the gates of the underworld to begin a journey of the very fabric of the Abrahamic religion. And of course, what better place to to begin than with hell. In Dante's Inferno, hell is depicted as nine concentric circles of eternal pain and torment located deep within the bowels of the earth. These consist of limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, wrath, heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery, each of them dedicated to facilitating astutely specific and horrifying torments to bind any hateful soul for eternal punishment. Perhaps the worst of these is the Malbolge, the eighth circle of hell that consists of the Ten Bolgers, a series of deep ditches where fraudsters, grifters, and thieves alike are dismembered and disemboweled over and over for eternity by a host of demons. Yeah, it's a pretty nasty place. Next up at number three, Arrakis. Because talking about nasty and equally inhospitable places, Frank Herbert's fascinating and terrifying desert planet of Arrakis that makes up the homeworld of his fantastic sci-fi epic novel Dune is perhaps its own version of hell for those not willing to adapt to the relentless trials and torments that lurk deep within it. For those of you that haven't read Frank Herbert's Dune saga, please, please do. Although they are pretty lengthy books, so I'll forgive you if you choose to watch David Lynch's 1984 film instead, because they're both great. Although the books are the fact of the matter is though, when it comes to Arrakis, there's a lot to get through, so I'll try and condense things as much as possible. As laid out in the Dune Saga, the planet of Arrakis is a desert wasteland, battered eternally by scorching heat and a dry, arid climate where pretty much nothing can live or grow, save for a few hardy species of mice. Oh, and yeah, of course, a population of giant freaking sandworms that live deep within the planet's surface, erupting out of the desert wasteland to destroy anything and everything whenever they feel like it. You might be thinking, well, why would anyone ever want to go to Arrakis then? And well, that's because the planet itself is the most valuable planet in the cosmos, and at the beginning of the saga, it is the only place in the universe that produces spice, an incredibly powerful resource that powers spaceflight. And whoever controls the spice controls the destiny of mankind, and thus begins the eternal struggle and chaotic political espionage that is Frank Herbert's Dune saga. Because although we've somewhat touched on the geographical horrors that lie within Arrakis, we haven't even gotten close to how damn violent 
violent and dangerous living on this planet would be if you somehow found yourself as a character in the novel, especially if your last name is Atreides and your first name just so happens to be Paul. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't matter what material terrors are lurking within a fictional world because if you fill it with enough villains, assassins and bloodthirsty berserkers, it kind of just writes itself. Swinging in at number two, Kamora. And truth be told, we couldn't really do this list without somewhere mentioning the grim darkness of the Warhammer 40k universe. And although there are more nightmarish worlds and dimensions of pure chaos that make up the fictional realm, perhaps the most terrifying of them all is the dark city of Kamora, the vile, obscene and impossibly evil home of the Dark Elder. In the Warhammer universe, the city itself is said to be impossible for any outsiders to find, and it is widely believed to be hidden deep within the interdimensional labyrinth of the Webway, a corrupted version spreading out across the cosmic chaos like a virus. Because of that, Kamora is a city of impossible creation, linked together by shimmering dimensional shortcuts, portals that are scattered throughout the galaxy, sometimes light years apart, but bound together by the chaos of the Dark Eldar's corruption. I mean, Kamora is such an evil place that even the shadows that slink through the city have a habit of consuming its inhabitants. Not like it matters either, as Kamora's population is estimated to be more than most star systems and is considered to be bigger than even mankind's largest hive cities combined. And it's also important to note that the population is comprised of some of the most evil, treacherous and violent individuals in the entire Warhammer universe. Trillions of them. All condensed into one sprawling viral city and truth be told, Kamora puts to shame pretty much every other den of evil in fiction. Mordor can move over, forget about Azkaban or any of its ilk. In fact, when Ben Kenobi told Luke Skywalker that he couldn't find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy than Moss Eisley, he obviously had never visited Kamora. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the Dreamlands. Because, of course, we cannot talk of terrifying places in literature without paying homage to Lovecraft's most complete and horrifying dimensions, the Dreamlands. The fact of the matter is we could probably make an entire list out of Lovecraft's bizarre and terror-inducing alien planets, but it's in the extra-dimensional impossibility of the landscape that he described in his dream cycle where the horror that we all share lies. Because what could be more terrifying than a realm that we could all potentially access in theory anyway. First noted in his 1918 short story Polaris and as described in perhaps his most complete novella, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, Lovecraft went on to fully flesh out the Dreamlands in a series of short stories written between 1918 and 1932, portraying entire cities of moon beasts, man-eating spiders, vast plateaus of satyr men that worship toad priests and castles of ancient design perched upon mountains of black rock. The thing is, like with many of Lovecraft's cosmic horror, it comes with the magnitude of not knowing where this land begins and where it ends. The dreamlands could be infinite. And as Randolph Carter discovered in the dream quest of Unknown Kadath, the terrifying extent to this place is limited only by the human imagination. Oh, and also not only that, but of course, nowhere is safe from the outer gods, not even human consciousness, because the crawling chaos himself, Nyarlathotep, holds dominion over the dreamlands, slowly pulling the strings and puppeteering his way across the realm, corrupting dreamers and lost souls alike, as well as the unfortunate races that populate its bizarre and impossible landscape. Essentially, the Dreamlands is Lewis Carroll's Wonderland, except instead of slipping through a looking glass or falling down a rabbit's warren, you could accidentally find yourself in this place during a bad dream, and then become addicted to the mysteries and infinite curiosity of its design, and before you know it, you're a dream junkie searching for Kadath like Randolph Carter. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, this place is messed up. Kicking off at number five, Castle Gormangast, the Gormangast series. All right guys, I'm probably telling a little bit of a white lie with this one, but stick with me because I'm fairly certain for those that are unaware of this gem of a series, it's well worth it. The Gormangast series written by Mervyn Peake is one of the most fantastic works of gothic fantasy horror ever written, and it's still strange to see it as such an enigma in the works of literature. Honestly, Gormangast is so underrated that it borders on criminal, but still, it has its place where it counts, and beyond the realms of contemporary fiction is considered one of the finest fantasy series ever written. That's because it is. And now if I'm being completely honest, it's not that scary unless you find yourself in the way of the Machiavellian mind of Steerpike, but for the fact of us detailing one of the most mysterious and looming structures in the whole of Gothic literature, it's definitely worth it. And as far as ancient, impossibly large castles go, Castle Gormangast 
is the blueprint for all of them. In Mervyn Peake's first novel, Titus, grown written way back when in 1946, it detailed the ancient family of Grown, headed by Lord Sir Paul Crave, the 76th Earl of Grown, and his wife, Countess Gertrude. The couple give birth to the family's heir, Titus, but the novel itself isn't focused on the newborn just yet. Instead, it details the rise of Steerpike, one of the most fascinating anti heroes ever written, who starts life as a kitchen boy in the castle's bowels and slowly he makes his way upward, both physically and hierarchically. I mean, whether you want to carry this series on is another question, but Titus Grown on its own paints such a vivid picture of an impossibly large and imposing structure that it's so easy to get lost in the labyrinthian description. Honestly, I know it might not sound it, but reading. Reading Titus Grown is an experience. Mervyn's prose winds like echoed footsteps in a stone corridor, and before you know it, you're there in a maze of murder and intrigue, an ancient ritual. Yeah, I'm cheating a little bit with this one because, to be honest, I just wanted to talk to you guys about Gormagast. So. There we have it, on with the show. Swinging in at number four, Carcosa, an inhabitant of Carcosa. Okay, let's get into the meat and bones of this whole list with a little bit of everyone's favourite medicine, cosmic horror. The fact of the matter remains that although this specific place was only first ever alluded to in a short story with the mere passing of a reference, it has gone on to spawn one of the most mysterious and intriguing locations in the whole of literature without ever once being described. And so because of that, we're best served by delving into all of them. For fans of the works of H.P. Lovecraft, which, let's face it, is the vast majority of you, you'll know that the resounding writer of cosmic horror owed several of his literary titles to one of his predecessors, Ambrose Bierce, who, in 1886, first penned the name of the ancient and mysterious city of Carcosa in his short story, An Inhabitant of Carcosa. It details a man wandering alone through a bleak and bizarre wilderness who eventually realises that he is dead and stumbles through the ruins of the ancient and famous city of Carcosa. And the rest, as they say, is history, because it wasn't until 1895 that the fantastic author Robert W. Chambers then borrowed the name for his own horror series, The King in Yellow, again laying the foundation for the majority of Lovecraftian fiction, where he outlined the possible location of Carcosa on the distant shores of Lake Harley in the star cluster Hyades. Again, the legend of Carcosa grew, this time being wrapped up with the yellow sign, before being picked up again by Lovecraft and then added into the Cthulhu mythos. And that's where things got really terrifying, because instead of clarifying on the matter, they only got more mysterious. Alright, I get it guys, Carcosa by its nature is indescribable and unknowable, but that's the point of cosmic horror, right? The real weirdness is how many times this damn city has cropped up in other works of literature. It's been alluded to in more Lovecraftian fiction than you could ever imagine, but not only that, it appears in the works of David Drake, George R. R. Martin, Alan Moore, and countless others. In the fantastic season one of True Detective, Carcosa again is the crux of the whole show, and the yellow sign appears too. Hey, if you've seen True Detective, you know the implications of Russ Cole's and Marty Hart's findings at Carcosa. Yeah, put a pin in this one because we may never know. Next up at number three, The Abyss, Dungeons and Dragons. Alright guys, I'm not going to lie, this list is a little bit of a crowd pleaser, but hey, it's got everything that I love, Gormagast, Cosmic Horror, and then the next best thing, D&D. For those of you that have played Dungeons and Dragons, the finest pen and paper role playing game ever created, you'll know how rich and impossibly vast the fictional cosmology of its universe truly is. And for a canon that relies on over 45 years of expanded universes upon expanded universes, there is perhaps only one place that takes the cake as the home of everything and anything evil. Well, chaotic evil, to be specific. The Abyss, otherwise known as the infinite layers of the Abyss, or the aforementioned 666 layers of the Abyss, a place of such overwhelming evil that even warlocks fear to tread. Or rogue warlock hybrids. The fact that the Abyss has seen so many incarnations of what it is, and what it could be, has given rise to a whole topographical list of terrifying terrains. A place of existence that hosts a myriad of death and misery, fierce desert sandstorms, explosive volcanic activity, boiling lava and molten rock. Whilst at the same time, as you slip through its many layers, it's then a wasteland of blinding sub-zero glaciers, bottomless oceans filled with terrifying leviathans, putrid hellscapes of death, disease and all manners of fungal infection, and of course the blank 
infinite void of space. It's safe to say that if your party ever ends up in the abyss for whatever reason, you're pretty much good and dead, even if your alignment is chaotic evil, and even if you think you're the most evil demon in the valley. Not only that though, the abyss thrives on its demonic denizens, the Tanari, the ancient Oberiths, the Lumaris, and an unimaginable number of unknown and unexplored demonic life forms. And if that's not enough, the true terror of the abyss is that you'll never ever really know where you are, given the fact that it's infinite layers and planes of torment twist and turn eternally. The layers of the abyss are often described as a deck of playing cards, shuffled and then tossed away, piled together haphazardly or sometimes not at all. Chaotic evil shuffles the deck and before you figure out where you may be, it's already too late. The abyss, sinkholes, demon lords, yeah, it's a bit of a headache to say the least. It's a good job I play a bard so I can just dimension door out of there. Safety first, guys. Coming in at number two, Toe Dash Darkness, the Stephen King Macroverse. <sighs> this one has been a long time coming, but I for one am glad that we finally made it here. Also, I'll try and keep spoilers for this entry to a minimum, but please note we'll be talking a lot about the Dark Tower series and pretty much the outcome of some of the most important works ever written by Stephen King, so yeah. I guess you've been warned. Now, where do we even start with Todash Darkness, or well, Todash Space, maybe, or the Macroverse? No one's entirely sure what it's called or what it even is. In fact, whilst its very nature is to be mysterious and elusive, it's no great secret that the works of Stephen King are, in fact, connected. All of them, pretty much, from the Stand to Salem's Lot to the Mist, the Tommy Knockers, it, all of the works of Stephen King are interconnected in a mind-bending multiverse or macroverse, and it all converges in his resounding series. Series, the Dark Tower. Okay, we'll stop there because spoilers are abound, but the point is this macroverse, so to speak, in the strange edges and dark corners of it, is populated by Todash Darkness, the home of unknowable and unimaginable evil. It is said that it, more commonly known as Pennywise the Clown, was a creature that existed in the void between the macroverse before he ran into the Losers Club, but that's another story for a different time, because it is thought that Todash Darkness isn't just populated by it, or the dead lights, the evil, all-consuming eldritch energy that it actually is, but an entire host of impossibly evil creatures and creations that are just waiting to spill out into all of existence. Todash, in essence, is the act of travelling between the thin spaces of the macroverse, or thinnies, as is explained in the Dark Tower series, but I'll leave that for you to find out on your own. And Todash Darkness is the evil that is conjured if you linger there too long. It is the home of Cthulhu and the Leatherheads from under the dome. In the mist, the Arrowhead Project is believed to be the reason why the town of Bridgeton, Maine suddenly became a target of the macroverse. And the whole host of cosmic horrors that spawned around the town were of Todash Darkness. They are the Tommy Knockers. It's even thought that in From a Buick 8, the car itself is a portal to Todash Darkness, and that by proxy, Christine, the car from the novel of the same name, is a similar macroverse vessel. Yeah, Todash Darkness. Your guess is as good as mine. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the warp, Warhammer 40k. Okay, okay, I kind of got a little bit of flack in part one of this list for featuring Komara, the home of the Dark Elves, instead of the warp, but hey, we're working our way toward the big bad baddies of literature, okay guys? Part two, we're planning for the future. And if you think the concept of Todash Darkness is terrifying, move over, because it merely pales in comparison to the myriad of chaos and horrors that call the warp their home. This absolute box of cosmic horrors, also known as the Immaterium, the Empyrean, the Ether, the Sea of Souls, the Realm of Chaos, Warp Space, or in more succinct terms, the warp. It has many names for the many sentient species that try and bend it to their will, but of course, such is a sentient civilization's folly. It can't happen. This place is evil incarnate. It is the bizarre, anomalous dimension composed entirely of pure psychic energy that ties together the already terrifying grim darkness of the Warhammer 40k multiverse, and that's that's saying something. Now, whilst technically Komora is a location somewhere in the warp, the Immaterium is a much, much bigger beast, and there's a lot to chew through. The warp is the sole source of all psychic power and energy that make up the grim dark magic of Warhammer 40k, and because of that, it is also the home dimension of the Chaos Gods and their impossibly vast legions of demons in their realm of chaos. Korn, the Lord of Battle, Zinch, the Architect of Fate, Nurgle, the Lord of Decay, and Slanesh, the Dark Prince of Chaos. Yeah, if they're not already terrifying enough in their own right, this place is their stomping ground. It's their backyard that you just took a wrong turn into. It is thought by many that the psychic energy that makes up the Immaterium is believed to be the direct result 
of the existence of all sentient life in the universe, in particular the many intelligent species that make up the Milky Way galaxy. It is considered to be a dark reflection of that material universe and the warp is the ocean that relies on the chaotic psychic energy all raw emotions comprised of the physical form constantly swimming through the life force. It is also thought by many races that the immaterium is the final resting place of the spirits of the dead and for all intents and purposes it is the literal hell of Warhammer 40k. If you know anything about Warhammer even the most joyful of places is already hell so yeah this is like the bottom of all hell. It doesn't get much worse. Kicking off at number 5, Ashai, A Song of Ice and Fire. And you may have noticed that even over three parts of this list series, this is our first stop into the world of Planetos and George R. R. Martin's phenomenal piece of fantasy literature, A Song of Ice and Fire. Hey, listen, stop hating guys, I've been waiting for this series to be completed since the late 90s, we can wait a little bit longer, give the guy a break, alright? These things take time, but that's by the by, because whilst we're waiting for the winds of winter, we can pass beneath the shadow and cast our gaze to the east, to the Shadowlands, and its most mysterious and notorious of cities, a shy or a shy by the shadow if you're being particularly ominous. You see, the thing is though, the reason this entry takes number 5 in our list is because it's merely a matter of perspective when it comes to describing the fear behind a shy. You see, George Martin is a stickler for history and his allegorical appreciation of our own human history is exactly what makes his work so applicable here. From a Westerosi perspective, the land of a shy, a mysterious port city in the far southeast of Essos where the Ash River meets the Jade Sea, cascading down toward the Saffron Straits and then beyond that, a mountainous peninsula, the Shadowlands. That landscape told by sailors and pirates in port cities then becomes the most foreign and remote places imaginable to a small boy from Flea Bottom. And with that lack of knowledge comes fear. There's a lesson there. Yes, Ashai is a city made of black stone that drinks light. It is dark and gloomy. Its inhabitants are masters of ancient and arcane knowledge who worship the black goat and where anything goes as far as magic is concerned. But you see, all of these are whispers. We've never seen a shy, and we may never will. But the mystery is what keeps us curious. It could be the most terrifying hive of dark magic in the known world, or it could be that words are wind. And therein lies the point. Swinging in at number four, the Never Never, the Dresden Files. Contrary to that though, talking about places that certainly are incredibly well described landscapes of arcane and supernatural horror, we have to talk about Jim Butcher's The Never Never, the literal afterlife in his fantastic Dresden Files series. Now if you know anything about Butcher's work, you'll know that he has a particular knack at reinventing prominent horror tropes. In his world, vampires, werewolves and warlocks alike are fully fleshed out as intricate and individualistic entities, not any two of them are alike, and in many ways similar to Martin's work, only grey areas exist when it comes to the inner workings of the denizens of magic. And talking about reinvention, or I suppose homogeneity is a better term in this case, who better to take every afterlife in myth and legend and collide them all into one? The never never, the spirit world that exists alongside the mortal plane as a sort of alternate dimension, but is certainly not a mirror image. The never never is a vast and winding entity, it is far, far larger than the mortal world perhaps even infinite, and despite the vast knowledge of Harry Dresden and many other characters in the series, little is known about its inner working. You see, although I said it's not exactly a mirror image, it also kind of is, and wherever the Never Never touches the mortal plane, those two places will have a resonance of energies. If a portion of the Never Never is a mass of misery and evil, it will touch a place of the same energy in the mortal world, an abandoned prison perhaps, or the scene of a brutal massacre. In Butcher's series, the Never Never is Heaven, Hell, Olympus, Elysium, Tartarus, Gehenna, it is both the summer and winter courts of the Shi. The true mystical terror behind this mysterious webway is again how little is known about the place. So far, if it involves the Never Never, Harry Dresden's response is to just leave town. It's probably for the best. Next up at number 3, the Hotel Dolphin, 1408. And whilst many of you will probably wonder why the Overlook Hotel doesn't take this spot instead, my response would be, room 1408 is far more terrifying than that place ever could be. And also in many ways, 1408 is perhaps one of Stephen King's most terrifying, well, monsters I guess, because if you've read his remarkable 1999 short story, 1408, then you'll know how truly terrifying this entity of a room really is. Now obviously this particular entry isn't going to go without spoilers, so I'll try and keep things as loose and as fast as I can in order to paint just how demonic this hotel 
hotel room really is. But if you're really not in the business for having this story ruined for you, just pop on over to the next point. You see, as the tale describes, King's protagonist Mike Enslin is an author, a famous debunker of haunted houses and paranormal places across the United States. Ten nights in ten haunted houses, ten nights in ten haunted castles, and of course, his next release, ten nights in ten haunted hotel rooms. And as Mike Enslin finds out at the Hotel Dolphin on 61st Street in downtown New York City, there is a room of such bloody infamy that has been left empty for over 20 years. Upon his arrival, the hotel manager gravely warns him of room 1408's morbid history. He has been responsible for at least 42 deaths, 12 of them suicides, over a 68 year period. But He's heard it all before. Mike Enslin does this kind of thing for a living, and he won't be dissuaded by the pleas of some hotel manager. Well, obviously, I won't paint too much of a vivid picture because, really, you should read 1408 if you haven't already. But some of the scenes depicted in this story are genuinely some of King's most terrifying pieces of prose, particularly when it comes to a certain phone call that incessantly won't stop ringing. Yeah, it's probably for the best that I just leave things there, but room 1408 at the Hotel Dolphin is certainly one of the most memorable and equally terrifying places in horror literature. Coming in at number two, Autumno, the Silmarillion. And truth be told, although 1408 is a terrifying place, what better way to shatter the confidence of our imaginations than an entire iron fortress of some of the most evil entities ever created in fantasy fiction? You see, I've seen a lot of you top five scary fans calling for Mordor to appear on this list, but hey, we all know that Mordor is merely the summer home of the Dark Lord himself, and the real stronghold of evil incarnate is Atumno, or Adun, if you're so inclined. For fans of J.R.R. Tolkien's legendary work of fantasy, The Lord of the Rings, you'll know that the compendium behind the series, the Silmarillion fleshed out the primal evils of the world. The prime of those evils was Melkor, and this place, Atumno, far in the north of Middle-earth during the First Age, was the location of his deepest of fortresses. It lay in the Iron Mountains, above even Angband, his vanguard stronghold, carved into the very flesh of the earth. And essentially, if you're wondering where all of the many demons, wraiths, trolls, balrogs, and even the hideous race of orcs were first birthed from, it was this place. During the time of the Lamps, the creation mythos of Middle Earth, Melkor the first Dark Lord began digging his great pits deep within the bowels of the earth, clawing his way into the darkness, where he then lured and called out to the evil powers of the world to join him. Here he existed for millennia, eventually expanding upward through the Iron Mountains to the surface, where he constructed his vanguard fortress of Angband to wage a war upon the Valar in the War of the Lamps. Listen, there is so, so much lore behind the Silmarillion, particularly when it comes to Arda, but do you know that scene in the Fellowship of the ring where my man Gandalf does the whole fly you fools thing and has to wrestle with the Balrog. Well, yeah. This place is where they hibernated. And when I say they, I mean an entire army of them. A tumno. It's not a nice place. And finally, coming in at number one spot, the jaunt. And you see, I thought long and hard about where to place this entry on our list, and I'm relatively certain that when you strip it all back, the jaunt is perhaps one of the most terrifying places ever penned in literature. And who best to pen it? Of course, Stephen King. Hey, listen, I'm not bothered if we have the King of Horror show up twice on our list. In fact, I'm honoured. But for those of you that have read his 1981 short story, you may understand exactly why we have to put this place at the top of the pile. First published in the Twilight Zone magazine and later added to his 1985 collection, Skeleton Crew, this is perhaps one of King's most explicitly science fiction entries. The Jaunt, which is a short enough read, is a tale that takes place in the early 24th century, where the technology of teleportation, referred to as jaunting, is entirely commonplace and is used for instantaneous transportation across enormous distances where humanity has now pretty much colonised our entire solar system. Now I'll try my utmost not to ruin any of the actual bones of the story which solely features a young family about to jaunt their way to Mars, but it's in the exposition of this place that truly takes you off guard. You see, the jaunt is the place that you must pass through in order to be a recipient of this instantaneous teleportation and thus travel such immense distances, but as the pioneers in the early days of this technology quickly discovered, a traveller has to be completely unconscious to survive the jaunt effect, as is explained by the family's father as they prepare to undergo general anaesthesia at the beginning of the story. Alright, I'll stop there because really if you haven't read it, I'm sure that there's a PDF floating around somewhere for you to sink your teeth into, but honestly, I'm not sure if it's just me, but King seemed to have struck on an oddly specific nerve here. Maybe the jaunt is toadash darkness, maybe it's the place that we see when we close our eyes and go to sleep at night, but one thing is for certain. I don't ever want to find out. Soul Maiden Desaad says, Okay Jack, if you were going to be eaten by a zombie, who would be the one you'd want to be eaten by? And that is an absolutely 
Great question. Uh, I'm assuming that this is any zombified person from history, right? Tough one. Um, okay. Come on, it'd be pretty great to be eaten by zombie Shakespeare, wouldn't it? Although, zombie Boudicca is a pretty close contender, so that'd be insane as well. Yeah, either or. Shakespeare or Boudicca. Meggie Maguire says, the host was funny as hell. Smiley face. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant me, but then I realised that you meant 2006's The Host, directed by Bong Joon-ho. Yeah. So close. So very close. First up, Vlad the Impaler says, If I were to be reborn in Warhammer 40k, I would like to be an orc. Why? Because they seem to be the only race who actually have a good time and live a carefree and angst-free life. I agree entirely with that statement, Vlad. Ignorance truly is bliss, especially if you're in a warg. And finally, Coda the Marionette Ghoul Kun says, Jack, what is your favourite character that you've played in Dungeons and & Dragons? And what a brilliant question. Although I think I've answered this question briefly before. It was last year though, maybe. Though, through many different campaigns, I've only ever played one character that ever mattered. A dwarf bard named Grum the Guzzler. I go for the folk hero trait, I max charisma, and then I turn all of my campaigns into a traveling band of music and good times. Hey, no one said defeating evil couldn't have a soundtrack. I'm that soundtrack. <laughs>